Alright, fine, I'm listening to you. So, after having heard from Serbia and India, we go to just right to the other side of the planet. Um, the, our next speaker is sitting to my right is Tamara Adrian from Venezuela. She's a lawyer and graduated from the Andres Bello Catholic University in Caracas and obtained a doctorate in law from Paris II University. She's a professor at the Andres Bello Catholic uh, University um, and a professor as well at the Central University of Venezuela. And she is our contact person for Central and South America. Please. Thank you very much to you all. Uh, it's an honor, a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I would like to start by thanking uh, all the, the, the persons that have been uh, making possible to, to be here tonight. Uh, of course, uh, Transgender Europe, the Bell Institute, and all and each of you uh, uh, that are here uh, working and learning and discussing these issues with us. Um, as, um, as you probably know, uh, I'm a, a lawyer, and nobody's perfect for that. And so uh, my um, speech will be addressed to legal issues, but not in the, in the bad sense of the word, but uh, much more precisely in, in, in a very, very simple manner. Um, I'm a, uh, I'm a um, transsexual uh, woman. I'm a lesbian woman. I'm a feminist woman. Um, so I, I have many perspectives in order to, to see the same, the same uh, issues. And uh, uh, I would like then to address uh, three points uh, to your attention. One, uh, the problem relating to legal identities. Two, the problems relating to access to health. And three, other uh, social issues and problems that trans people may face in a very, very brief manner because I will be treating to uh, make a compact um, exposition about 23 countries at the same time. So and that, that's too many too many things to say um you know very well what walls are and how they divide people and how you may just uh, um uh, make them fall down and uh, to reunify people and uh to be all together uh gender and gender divides us and gender, it's making uh, us living apart in separate rooms uh, as uh, if we were behind a hall, a, a, a wall. And uh, that, uh, that is uh, very unfortunate because uh, the only thing we can make sometimes is try to go into the other hole. Uh, the, the, the opposite whole, but not being together, all together in the same place. I, I think this is the future. I mean, for me, uh, my, my goal is to, to uh, fight for um, a law that in the future will uh, prevent to put any mention to sex or gender in any legal document, because uh, I think it is uh, it, the, the basis of uh, what is needed in the registration documents uh, um, it's pretty much referred to, to things like uh, race. It was because some people could not have some rights that others uh, had. Or gender, because women didn't have the same rights than men. Uh, and then I think uh, there is a time to, to think about a little bit about that. But uh, in the meantime, uh, we have to, to know that uh, identity and, and, and going from one uh, room to the other is very important for trans people. Um, and for this purpose, I, I must point out in, in the first place that some countries recognize you as a person. And they recognize you as a person, uh, not only, you like Prezi, I, like, I love Prezi. <laughs> um, uh, they recognize you as a person uh, without surgery, and they change your gender and your name uh, very quickly in, in a very effective manner. That, uh, I, it's uh, the, under the law of uh, the Mexico City in this federal district in Uruguay and by general decisions in Argentina and they are discussing currently a law in the same sense and by expert decisions in Brazil and in Chile. 
But uh, most of the country only recognize you uh, to um, make an amendment of your sex or change your sex after a surgery. And that's the case in Panama by the law or under the constitution in, in Ecuador or by general decisions rendered in Colombia, in Brazil, in uh, Argentina before the, the, the recent decisions of the courts, in Venezuela until 1998 and in the spare decisions in Cuba. Uh, but some countries uh, grant you only to change your name, not your sex. You, uh, then uh, they, what they want is to prevent that you can marry in, in, in the opposite um, uh, sex. Uh, let me tell you that uh, as I'm a lesbian, I'm married to a woman because they haven't granted my identity. Then I... Uh, I'm legally married to my wife, and uh, that's the only uh, the only legally married um, couple, uh, same-sex couple in Venezuela. But uh, uh, it's quite a contradic contradictory because you may become Maria, uh, but being um, male, or you become uh, uh, Carlos, but being female, and that's quite contradictory. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that happens in Puerto Rico, in Ecuador, under restrict, uh, very restrictive interpretation made by the, the ombudsman of uh, Puerto Rico. And in some countries, they just do not allow you to change your sex nor your name, even after a surgery. And that's uh, unfortunately because uh, it includes... Uh, oh, excuse me, that was uh, before the surgery. Okay, no. Uh, that's the, the following. This is uh, the cases in which it is uh, possible to change your name before the surgery and change your sex after the, the surgery. Uh, this is the case of Colombia, Ecuador, and certain restrictive decisions in Chile. But uh, in, in some countries, well, they just deny your, your dignity as a person. And you cannot change no name nor sex even after a surgery. And that's the case of Venezuela, because after 1998, no single decision has been rendered. Uh, he filed a petition in, before the Supreme Court of Justice, uh, a constitutional um, uh, action uh, in 2004. And since then, they have not even decided on the, on the admission of, the, of, the, uh, of this uh, action. Um, but uh, in Central America, except for Panama, that I mentioned after a surgery, you may change uh, your name and sex. In the Caribbean countries, except at Cuba, um, because they, they may uh, also change after a surgery, in Peru and in Paraguay. With regard to, to, to health policies, uh, there you will also find huge difference. Um, on the one hand, you have um, certain uh, countries that uh, have a very, very important uh, public policy or health policies uh, addressed directly to trans uh, persons. Uh, this is the case uh, at the national level in Ecuador, very recently, two months ago, uh, in Chile, very recently, the, the two, month, two weeks ago, uh, at the state level, in uh, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, and Mexico, and uh, in some cases at uh, the a city level, uh, which is the case, for, exa for example, in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, but uh, in most of the countries, what happens is that if you are a trans person, you uh, uh, are almost uh, all the time denied of the much basic uh, access to health. If you, your um, uh, knee is broken, you, you arrive to the hospital and, well, they don't know how to treat you because you, you're not either and man and woman. And then, well, okay, uh, we cannot accept you here. Uh, but uh, in, in general, uh, you may find out that uh, the absence of, of uh, public policies of health relating to trans people, it's the common uh, situation in all Latin America. Um, with regard, finally, to other issues, labor, education, housing, and other relevant situations uh, that, affects, that are affected by discrimination, uh, this is unexistent in most of the places, um, except for very limited uh, uh, situations in, in, small, in certain cities, such as the city of Sao Paulo, very limited, and the city of Rio de Janeiro, and very recently some uh, small policies taken in, in um, the city of, um, of Buenos Aires. 
There are no really um, general policies aiming at protecting uh, trans people against discrimination or at the school, nor in housing, nor in, in jobs, uh, no in, in any, any of the human, uh, normal human rights. And uh, uh, this is a, a common situation, and uh, even in those countries which are policies relating to identity. Uh, hate crimes are also a common matter in every country, particularly as you saw in the, the, the map in Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, and Honduras. I received, while well, I was here, uh, the information that uh, yes, the day before yesterday, another trans person was murdered in the city of Maracaibo, and his body was found uh, in in uh, in bags uh, in in one river. Um, as a conclusion, uh, we think that. Uh, uh, we are some way in a halfway from purgatory to hell, not, not beyond purgatory. Um, in general, we have a long way uh, to go in America Latina, although there are big differences between the countries. But these differences are much more unacceptable, as you see that in some countries there are strong and, and very uh, courageous policies to protect um, trans people. Uh, a strategic, a strategic litigation has become a very important matter to act in our countries uh, because uh, it uh, permits you to overcome the absence of, of laws and uh, allows you to get decisions particularly rendered by constitutional courts that sometimes uh, um, give you the same effect uh, as a law. And, um, and this is why we, uh, we are so uh, encouraging in the region the uh, the existence of strategic litigation. This was a, an essay to overview uh, the legal situation of 22 countries. Of course, uh, I don't know. I don't think I was able to to give you too much information, but at least the, the most important uh, information. And uh, of course, I acknowledge there was a, an, an oversimplification of all the issues, and I will be uh, ready to to accept uh, uh, your uh, questions and and will be completing any missing. Uh, information and thank you very much. Thank you, Tamara. But I'm afraid the questions will have to wait until the discussion round. Um, our next speaker is Witness Boysen from South Africa. She's the outreach coordinator of Gender Dynamics and is originally from Louisville, a rural area in the Western Cape of South Africa. She's a community development worker and has filled various positions in community work. Witness, please. I thank you. Ladies and gentle ladies, good evening. I thank the Bull Foundation, I thank Transgender Europe, and I thank TVT for inviting me to sketch you what the situation for women like me and men not like me are in Africa, but with specific uh, work experience in South Africa. In Africa, there is a lack of specific legislation for trans people, especially in most African countries. One of the few exceptions is that gender recognition are in the legislation of South Africa, but not in other countries of Africa. There is no public recognition of trans people as having specific demands, no differentiation for ERGB slash TI in Africa. We as gender dynamics make a slash between ERGB and TI because we see it as, as totally different categories. It reflected in laws dealing with gender violence, the legal and social response to people who express gender in conflict with birth sex is all based on notions of sexual practices. People see it all as homosexuality in Africa. And trans people also have no whatsoever uh, information about themselves. People in Africa face violence and inequality and sometimes torture and even execution because of their gender expression. Discrimination is the most common issue that trans people face in the majority of countries and on a daily basis on the ground of sexual orientation or gender identity. Discriminatory practices can be found in the workplace and in public sphere, especially regarding access to healthcare 
and education. 38 countries of Af in Africa criminalize sexual acts between persons of the same sex under sodomy laws. These laws are applied in cases of cross-gendered expressions to no matter if that person was not having sex or is in a partnership with a same-sex person. And these laws are in some states inherited by the colonial masters and not based on Africa pursue. For some Islamic states, these laws fall under sh Sharia law. Penalties range between imprisonment for one year to life, and in some countries, for example, in Sudan and northern Nigeria, the penalty is dead. Some African states, such as Burundi and Rwanda, are making efforts to initiate these laws now. LGB slash TI people are increasingly facing violence and I no. I already did that stage. Oh, and I and <laughs> And I hate crimes in states, sorry, they do not criminalize homosexuality. And even in South Africa, which is the only country in Africa whose constitution recognizes sexual orientation and gender identity. A possible reason for the increase could be in increased visibility as the transgender and lesbian gay movement grows internationally. And at the same time, the prejudice response of growing evangelism all over Africa. In most of these countries, religion is the instrument of oppression. It is also interesting to know that most of these evangelistic religious movements are led and financed by churches from the West. Many leaders openly encourage and incite violence with homophobic speeches in public and in the media. And most often their silence in the face of others is also a call to violence, and thus they fail in their duty to protect the LGB slash TI citizens from abuse. In June 2009, several persons, including two teenagers, teen, two teenagers were arrested in Senegal. They were detained and several were convicted for alleged sexual acts against nature, and some of the people were trans people. A very Dragonian bill was tabled in Uganda's parliament in October 14, 2009, and this bill if it is passed into law, would impose the severe punishment on LGB slash TI people who performed non-normative forms of gender expression. The bill also proposes the following. Life imprisonment for the offense of homosexuality, five to seven years for defending and promoting the basic human rights of LGB slash TI people, and the death penalty for aggravated homosexuality. I want to tell you a story of Vanya, who's a trans woman in Africa. Vanya lives her whole life as a trans woman, but her home affairs refuse to change her ID, and whenever she goes, or her gender in her ID, and whenever she goes to the bank to withdraw money from her own bank account, forensics are called so that they can verify her signature. And for a trans woman, believe me, it's a very big embarrassment. South Africa is regarded as the leading country in, the, in our continent when it comes to legislation. With our progressive constitution and leading on LGB slash TI rights. And since the end of apartheid, LGB slash TI rights are enshrined in our constitution, although people at grassroots do not necessarily know how to access these rights. Possible access to service for transgender people looks better in South Africa, although it's far from ideal. If you look at issues of poverty and potential income, the cost that trans people pay for surgery is still unacceptable high. Medical insurance does not cover the demands. The only hospital which we know of that can give surgeries can only give four surgeries per year. In South Africa, is not the resource haven for trans people in Africa. With the overwhelming violations by agents of states, one would assume that the plight of the ERGB slash DI African ends when they die. But no, 
Today, the bodies of ELGB slash DI people in Senegal are exhumed from cemeteries. We know of a case in Tanzania where the body of Auntie Victoria, who was a well-known transgender woman and trans activist, was put on public display as post-mortem exhibition. We as trans people in Africa want our gender to be, re- to be recognized without the fear of being raped, being murdered, being attacked, being assaulted, or being said ugly things to. Gender Dynamics, the company which I work for, put up a stra- strategic plan to do outreach to communities with advocacy tools. In that way, trans people will learn to approach clinics hospitals, departments, etc. What Gender Dynamics also do is, is we have an exchange program and there is information on the table where transgender activists from other countries in Africa learn more about the regional work they done. Because we believe the only way a movement can be sustainable is through strong communities who understand their rights in the context of their own advocacy and for them to have a political world. Ladies and gentle ladies, danke shay, paya danke, I thank you so much, and kos kakul. Thank you, witness. Our next speaker did not just take a plane to get to Berlin. I think she embarked on a voyage, basically, (laughs) to make it here. Um, She is the founder and executive director of Tonga's Lady Association, Nukualofa. And who does not know um, where Nukualofa is, that's the capital of the Kingdom of Tonga. The next speaker is Jolene Mataele. Um, the Tonga Lady Association has a focus on improving the rights and celebrating the country... Sorry, again. The Tonga Lady Association has a focus on improving the rights and celebrating the contribution of ladies in Tonga. Um, and Jolene, the executive director, is as well an international activist and a well-known entertainer and choreographer in the Pacific region. And everybody who has visited Big Stöckel knows that this must be a rather humble description. <laughs> Jolene, please. <laughs> Don't cry for me, my Berlina. <laughs> that through this I'll never leave you. All through my trans days, my mad existence, I'll keep my promise if you don't keep your distance. <laughs> Secretary Gen- General Ben Moon says, we can fight stigma, enlightened laws and policies are key, but begins with openness, the courage to speak out, schools should teach respect and understanding, religious leaders should preach tolerance, the media should condemn prejudice and use its influence to advance social change from securing legal protections to ensuring access to health care and rights to all. Albert Einstein said, Our current problems cannot be solved with the same level of thinking which created them. And I said, Guten Abend, Berlin. (laughs) Through PSDN, this research was able was able to be done only with the help of its members and the other and its other associate members. In the Pacific region there is some resentment about the concept of human rights. Some of our leaders are fond of decrying them as a Western or alien concept at odds with our values. Doing this research has most certainly given me a better picture and more knowledge on how things are in the Pacific. And what has been mostly kept silent in a lot of ways just because of our culture and taboo. Human rights are universal in nature. They are about fairness and decency. This presentation will be based on what we transgenders in the Pacific go through. 
In some Pacific countries, transgender people are, and same-sex relationships are not recognized or protected by law. This lack of legal recognition contributes to social invisibility and lack of influence on policymakers and official responsible for resource allocations and service delivery. Criminalization perpetuates discriminatory and outmoded beliefs of some health professionals who consider transgender status as diseases or disorders. Interestingly, it is not the downtrodden, the oppressed, or the marginalized who make the criticism. Legal barriers, stigma, and discrimination, and gender inequality all make transgender and sexual minorities more vulnerable. For the Pacific to effectively respond to the human rights issue, these factor, factors must be addressed. Sorry, darling, you're going a bit too fast. Can you go back to the map? <laughs> and those of you who haven't been to the Pacific, here is the Pacific. <laughs> and if you don't, if you really want to see it tonight, here is the Pacific. <laughs> Next, here are the members of the. Pacific Sexual Diversity Network, as you know, they're all the flowers of the Pacific. Transgenders in the Pacific. All Pacific transgenders are negatively affected by gender norms. Some Pacific cultures include gender categories that do not align with Western male, female dichotomies, constituting third sexes, such as Samoan Fafafini, Sipungi, PNG Palopas, Tongan Fakaleti, Fakatangata, or Fijian Vakasale Walewa, to name a few. In the Polynesian countries, there are certain laws that are not acted upon, such as cross dressings. In the Polynesian countries, you see the transgenders in dresses from no morning till night. In some Melanesian countries, who discriminate transgender, who acts like or dresses in women's clothes during the day in public, the only time you see transgender in female attire in these countries it is only at night and only in the city areas. There was one time we had dinner at the royal, one of the royal uh, residents in Tonga, and I asked his majesty, what is your opinion in this homosexuality law in Tonga? His answer was, why are you worried about this law? Because it's a biblical law and it was brought in by the English missionaries. And you have grown up knowing all the royal chefs were all gays. And not only that, but have I or anyone in the royal family ever stopped you from wearing women's clothes to the palace or any of the government functions? No. So I suggest that you enjoy life as it is. And with that note, I would like to say that the German missionaries and traders are to be blamed too for also bringing the law to Samoa and pretty much dominated the islands of Samoa and the northeast of Papua New Guinea in somewhere around the 1850s to the 1860s. In the Pacific, the terms LGBT, MSM, and transgender are increasingly used mainly in regional and international contexts, especially when we deal with donors. <laughs> Give me money. We are very fortunate in the Pacific that we, as a network, has, have our champions and prophylic supporters, such people as the Prime Minister of, the, of Samoa, the patron of the Samoa Foundation, our AIDS Foundation, and the Samoa Fafafinge, Her Royal Highness Princess Salotiru Pipau, the patron of the Tonga Ladies Association, Dame Carol Kidu, former Minister of Community Development of Papua New Guinea, President Ratu Epeli Nailatikau, President of Fiji, and few others in the Pacific Islands. Here are some activities. 
I'm going to fire this technical person. <laughs> Marking a significant step towards achieving Fiji, the Fiji, um, Fiji's universal excess goals, Fiji passed a law decriminalizing consensual hom- homosexuality through the Fiji National Crimes Decree on the 1st of April 2010. With this legislation, Fiji becomes the first Pacific Island nation with colonial era sodomy laws to formally decriminalize sex between men. The new crimes decree removes all clauses about sodomy and unnatural acts and uses gender-neutral language in the remainder of the sexual offenses section. Working for equality for transgenders and other sexual minority groups from all forms of discrimination, implementing and facilitating capacity building for the empowerment of the Pacific Transgender Network and other sexual minority groups in the Pacific, example, to increase decision-making and implement a commitment, implement a commitment for comprehensive response to transgender needs, such as sexual health, access to t- for treatment, hormones, and economic empowerment. Conducting research training and specialized conferences for the promotion of the network's aims, assess epidemiological situation for transgenders in the Pacific Island countries advocating for legal and suitable recognition, liaising with government ministries, NGOs, and individuals who are concerned with the issues of sexual orientation, discriminations, and domestic violence. Advocating for legal and suitable recognition of the Pacific transgenders, network, and other sexual minorities in order to properly fit in with the society. And liaising with the government ministries, NGOs, and individuals who are concerned with the issues of sexual orientation, discrimination, and domestic violence. Yes. (laughs) Ein Hash. Oh, Hash Lixus. Dankeschön. (laughs) Whoops. An Kala Lagata, Jan Huta, TVT Project. A Royal Foundation. Fafitai Lava, Malo Alpito, Vinakavalevu, Dan Yavad, Tenku, Metaki Maata, Dankeshan. May God bless you all. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our last speaker of the day, which is Naomi Fontanos. She's the current chairwoman of the Society of Transsexual Women of the Philippines, short STRAP. She's a member of the International Advisory Board of the World Professional Organization for Transgender Health and was involved in drafting the seventh version of the standards of care, which just have been released last week. Um, Naomi, please. I feel inadequate now. I think Jolene should have gone last. How could someone follow her? (laughs) I would love to sing for all of you, but you will have to pay me. (laughs) Mabuhai. Good evening, everyone. I am here to talk about the situation of trans people in East and Southeast Asia. My name is Naomi Fontanes, the chairwoman of the Society of Transsexual Women of the Philippines, or STRAP. For more information on the work that we do back home, please visit us at the following websites. Let's begin. In 2008, the Supreme Court of the Philippines disapproved a petition of a transsexual woman to change her name and sex in her birth certificate from male to female, insisting that she was a man with man-made female genitalia and that allowing her to do so would negatively impact the legal status of women in my country. Last year, a high court in Hong Kong disapproved a petition of W, a trans woman, to marry, maintaining that there is no consensus in Hong Kong that marriage includes transsexual people. Just last month, an administrative court decision was made in Bangkok, compelling the Thai military to change the reason for the exemption of Katui or trans women from conscription. Instead of exempting them for military service due to psychosis, they will now be exempted because they have gender identity disorder. 
From East to Southeast Asia, the majority of trans people face a similar situation. Silenced, excluded, and erased. Most trans people have no say over their identities. Their lived realities are belittled and dismissed, and state and cultural forces act to render them powerless with no control over their own lives. Laws that impact the trans community are crafted without consulting them. More often than not, these laws tend to dehumanize the very people that they are meant to serve. In Japan, the law requires trans people to be of legal age, not to be married, to be sterilized, and to have genital surgery to be able to change the legal sex into their gender identity. Colonial laws are used to criminalize trans people as well. In Singapore, Section 377A can be used to arrest transgender people on the grounds of gross indecency. In Southeast Asia, trans people are in legal limbo, with many able to live and socially present as the gender they identify as, but with documents still reflecting their opposite birth sex assignment a situation that attracts prejudice into their lives. Trans people in East and Southeast Asia who are not born to well-to-do families can have very difficult lives and suffer years of economic deprivation. Accessing health care, education, housing, and other social services can be a great challenge as well because of pervasive prejudices in these spaces that are based on religious dogma. Discrimination and abuse is part of the daily reality of trans people in Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Thailand, Singapore, and the Philippines. Many are an easy target for murder and hate-based crimes, as there are no laws in these countries that protect them from bias-motivated crimes. Like others elsewhere in the world, trans people in East and Southeast Asia are coerced to make a choice between a life of dignity and their gender identity, as if these two were exclusive of each other. Desperate and hopeless, and thinking that they will never have a future in their own countries, many trans people are forced into the diaspora when they leave their homelands to escape the transphobia in East and Southeast Asia. It behooves those who stay to rally and bring about the changes that are badly needed to improve the lives of the ones who are left behind. In the Philippines, I, along with other, with two other transgender Filipinas or trans Pinais, sent a communication in May 2011 asking the UN Human Rights Council to compel the Philippines to address the dire situation of trans people in my country. In Hong Kong and Thailand, trans people are slowly coming together, forging circles of friendship, brotherhood, and sisterhood to build a movement for change. Through collective struggle, they are now challenging years of oppression and living in the margins of their societies. In closing, I would like to thank the following for their contribution to the project. Don Madrona, of the Society of Transsexual Women of the Philippines, or STRAP, Leona Law in Singapore, Azusa Yamashita of Gay Japan News, Joan Leung of the Transgender Resource Center in Hong Kong, Lee Hyun in South Korea, and Prem, Kath, and Jessica of the Thai Transgender Alliance in Thailand. The tireless work that you do in your home countries has made today's presentation possible. More importantly, it fills my heart with hope for the possibility in the future of a better life for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, I now after we have received a detailed overview over the legal framework for gender recognition in Central and Southern America, after we have heard about the absence of gender recognition in most of Africa and the violence and criminalization LGBTI people face, 
after we've been introduced um, to the flowers of the Pacific, the Facaleti, the Fafafine, and the Facasale, Wa, Lewa, and others which I am not attempting to pronounce. Um, and after we've heard that in Asia, even the constitutional courts are not very helpful um, in, the, in advancing trans rights as they deny trans people the right to marry and the right to legally recognize their gender, I would like to ask you now to use the following minute to turn to either your left or your right neighbor and share with this person what was the most striking um, fact that you heard in this um, evening, what was the most surprising thing that you heard, and um, share this with your neighbor. And then after, when this minute is over, we, we start the discussion um, and we open the floor for, this, uh, for questions. Please. <laughs> Yes. Hi, thank you. You're still on my computer, so yes. And, and I also heard ladies, gentle ladies, gentle ladies and gentle ladies. Gentle ladies. Yes. <laughs> Some free plugging there for gender dynamics. Right Jolene, thank you for the song. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. oh, oh Jolene. Yeah. Come together, okay? Oh no, don't go on on the photo. <laughs> one more, honey. One more, honey. One more. Honey. Another one, another one. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> what was striking? <laughs> what was striking for me today was the uh, fact that we are there are bitches, butches, dykes, and demons. Bitches, butches, dykes, and demons. Please. <laughs> <laughs> We're very on time. I think you just spoke. Yes, everybody. Ten minutes. Yes, exactly. Everybody, almost everybody, was exactly on time. Carla was tensed. Okay. Um, isn't it surprising how fast a minute can can pass? <laughs> so. I'd like you to continue this private discussion um, after we're finished. We now have 30 minutes left for this uh, for discussion and question to the to the panel. I would say that um, you can ask all the all the people on the panel. However, you should try to focus on the four speakers um, of the second part. So, who has questions? Please. Ah, in second. Hello, my, my name is Sebastian. I've got a question for Tamara Adrian. Um, we saw the, the uh, trans murder numbers uh, of Latin America, and it was presented that there are four countries with uh, especially high numbers of murders. Could you, could you tell us more about the situation in these countries? What are the uh, specific reasons for these, uh, these numbers? And... Uh, who can be turned to to uh, bring about changes there? And I think we just collect a second question, Lila. Uh, Lila Lenemann, uh, Berlin Anti-Discrimination Office. Um, ich sag mal auf Deutsch. Right. Kann jemand von euch übersetzen? In, in English. <laughs> <laughs> Meine Frage geht an alle oder auch speziell an die, das Forschungsprojekt, nämlich ob es ein Land oder mehrere Länder oder überhaupt Orte gibt, wo es möglich ist, den Geschlechtseintrag zu ändern, ohne ein externes Gutachten. Okay, and I think we take a third question and then we're going to have a round of answers. Um, Dido, my question is for tomorrow. Um, you said at Wickstöckel that uh, the situation in Venezuela is uh, rather, diff uh, rather contradictorious. How does it come that the situation in Venezuela after the social process is uh, getting a bit more emancipatory, as I would say, is getting more worse for trans people, as uh, I hear now? And... Uh, 
How does it come that, uh, as far as I know, in um, Argentina, for example, especially in Buenos Aires, trans people are rather uh, good organized in social movements. Uh, in the past, uh, trans people were very active in the Piqueteros in Buenos Aires, as far as I know. And as far as I know, uh, trans people are also very well integrated in the social movements in Honduras, for example. Um, Uh, how is uh, how is the situation of trans people in the social movements in Venezuela? I would like to know. Thank you. Hello, Alele. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to say thank you to Charlene for being inviting me here tonight. I really uh, want to. I really have a question to Carl and Jan Simon. Um, at the moment, I'm still motherhood for my child. It's almost um, two years, and I am also the. Um, um, she a lady of uh, one of the Pacific society that um, we found in um, Tsurikun, um, 2006. And we, we are doing um, youth uh, in action with the other, come and other partner from the European countries. And I'm just thinking because um, next year, not only next year, but for the next few years, we have a few uh, interesting pro projects from um, here in Europe, not only from Tonga, but from the whole South Pacific who live here. And it's not only for 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 the it's for for, for the European and non-European citizen. And my question is, if we're gonna make a uh, project for next year or the next few years that we are building because we have enough people in this in this direction. Um, it's a, how can how can you support or, or help to support us to fund? And is that a possibility that I can connect here with uh, so my speaker from uh, Joey, Jolene uh, from Tonga? In the future, I mean, there's, there, maybe maybe it's very private. Private my question, but mm. I mean, we are, I'm, I'm I'm very interesting. That's why I'm asking. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think we're gonna um, answer now all the questions, and then we have a second round of of, of questions. I think we go from Tamara to um, Jan and Carla, and then whoever wants to contribute to the question of Lila Lenneman regarding legal gender recognition. Thank you very much for the, the questions. I think uh, they are interrelated to uh, uh, them all. Uh, with regard to, to the, the question uh, relating to murders, um, Bondard was the name. Um, the, uh, the situation is very difficult in, in Latin America um, because intolerance is... Uh, Hugh, um, many things contribute to this. One, uh, churches, particularly uh, the um, evangelical churches that are very important in Brazil, in Venezuela, and in other countries in Central America, and in other countries, much more than Catholic uh, churches, um, that um, that that's making uh, a social change uh, which has an impact uh, pretty much the the LGBTI rights. Um, Intolerance, generally intolerance relating to to um, non-conforming sex and gender, and uh, in the particular case of uh, Venezuela, and I, I will address in the, the second detail as a question. Um, the problem may be related also to to social intolerance and political intolerance we are facing. Um, for instance, uh, two weeks, three weeks ago, uh, I requested. Well, we have been there and there and there and there asking for rights, equal rights, etc. For many many years now, and our last attempt was in January of, as of this year. Uh, we organized a march. Uh, and we file a petition uh, of an amendment of uh, one single article that will allow us to change uh, name and sex in, the, in all the legal documents in the civil registry law. 
and um, uh, we gave this petition to the to the um, um, president of the National Assembly. After seven, several months, uh, we didn't receive any any any, uh, any answer from him, from him, and then uh, we requested for a second uh, meeting. And at this meeting, we were requested to have at least hundred people to come, hundred friends. Uh, in a country as such as Venezuela, in a working day, at the daylight, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. Nonetheless, I was able to to join more than uh, we were 97, and we're told the president is not going to receive you because you are not a hundred the promised people. And we protested, and he arrived five hours and a half late. Finally, we were received. We were able to talk very short, two minutes each person, 12 persons. And uh, the response of the president of the National Assembly was something like, you know, social movements and, and change, legal changes uh, are very slow. Uh, you should not expect to have any legal change for the following years. And, and I was upset and I, 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 I told in, in loud voice when, when he was talking. And in the meantime, 80% of the population in Latin America has their, their identities recognized. And here in Venezuela, you're talk, talking about a revolution. This is a, conservatory, a conservative revolution then. And um, he was upset because of what I said. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm leaving now. No, don't, don't go. I'm just saying what it is. I mean, we are in the bottom line of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the countries. And Honduras, with Honduras, uh, with uh, Brazil, with Nicaragua, with regard to murders and with regard to, 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 to the situation um, of uh, social movements, yes, we we have a certain uh, cohesion uh, with regard to trans movements, uh, either belonging to LGBT movements, or to eight movements, or trans movements. But uh, um, the problem is that uh, most of our trans people uh, have a first or the second or third degree of uh, primary education as the must. And uh, they, are, they cannot be easily empowered. That's a huge problem. And finally, a very, very short, um, the change of name and sex without surgery is not the new standard uh, of protection for trans people all around the world. And uh, the first country was, of course, UK and then uh, the uh, Spain. And since then in Latin America, uh, we have uh, three countries that are applying it. it, it uh, Mexico in federal district, um, Uruguay uh, since 2008, and um, Argentina because they are um, using the constitutional way in the course to, to get the changes. As, uh, as a way of injunction. Um, but they are discussing in this very moment uh, a law for the same purpose. Regarding the woman from Tonga, I forgot your name, sorry. Uh, I would love to talk to you later uh, in private and then we can discuss this in detail. So. Uh, welcome. And regarding Leila's uh, question, this is a very it's very difficult to, uh, to answer these questions because there's the question, what is meant by external document? Do you mean pathologization? Do you mean um, another document? We got some information about uh, some places where it's possible, but this information is contradictory, so we can't make definite uh, statements. And I guess... What's most important is that there are other requirements which are more important for trans people and human rights defenders, such as uh, forced sterilization and gender reassignment surgery as a, as a requirement. And we know of situations in some countries where this gender legal recognition is not a bureaucratic uh, process, but is more... Um, seen as a process inside a family or the community. For example, if a father says, we called her a Jenny since she was five, then you can change the name without problem, without having such bureaucratic things, because it's a different system. So this is very hard to answer, because it's always um, yeah, different systems. Uh, 
Um, in the Pacific region, uh, I think New Zealand would be the only uh, New Zealand and Australia would be the only other place that has done the the legal change of, of identity. But their passports doesn't say either male or female. It's just a slash. I don't know why, but I can find out if I get to talk to their ministers. In the other Pacific Islands, it's a definite no. Maybe in the next 10 years, when we sit, when we sit on the chair of being a prime minister, the first transsexual prime minister, yes, we will be able to. In many East Asian countries, sexual assignment surgery is a prerequisite for uh, legal uh, legal sex change in the documents. In Southeast Asia, it's completely unheard of. Um, just about two months ago, a transsexual woman in Malaysia um, died after a court decision was handed down on her petition for a change of name and sex in a birth certificate. And so the Malaysian activist community um, were up in arms and said that Malaysia killed her. And she died of sadness because of her inability to change her documents. Um, in my country, in the Philippines, before 2002, transsexual people could change their birth certificates through the courts. But in 2002, a law was established called the Clerical Error Law, which states that only the name in the birth certificate can be changed, but the sex is immutable. It can never be changed. It is, some, it is something that, 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 that cannot be that cannot be changed in spite of sex reassignment surgery um, being available for a lot of transsexual people in, in the Philippines. And, and then in 2008, a Supreme Court decision was, was handed down as well in, in my country regarding the petition of a transsexual woman asking for a change of name and sex. And the Supreme Court said no. So we have... A case in most of Southeast Asia of having transsexual people who are able to socially present in the gender that they identify as, but they carry documents of their birth sex assignment. And it, as I said earlier, um, it creates a lot of um, trouble and attracts prejudice into our lives. For example, coming here, um, I had to pass through immigration at Amsterdam and there were so many other lines and people were just passing through um, showing their passports and then giving their probably invitation letters from the companies that they would work for and they would be let through easily. When my turn came, the immigration officer said, do you have your invitation letter? And so I produced the invitation letter and then, can I have your, your hotel accommodation? And then I had to produce my hotel accommodation. Um, and then she asked me so many documents, and I caused some traffic at immigration, at least at my line. And so it was quite embarrassing. But um, this is a reality for many trans people from Southeast Asia. Um, I'm living in Black Hole, Europe. So there's no people. There is no change. But in some places, yeah, there's trans people, so no, they cannot change, of course. But they can change the name in neutral. Do you know the, the term? Uh, yeah, some, some names, no, more, most of the names are uh, gendered divided. So in some countries, you can be neutral named. So that's new thing. You don't have to change anything. You don't have to go uh, undergo surgeries or anything. You can change the name in neutral in some countries. But in most of the countries, if you are going, to, uh, going through all the surgeries and all the medical treatment, you can change after that. Uh, we, there is no law for that. That's a problem, of course. That's not regulated. So that's the goodwill of the clerks. So they can change it or they can just be stunned by the gap of the law. So they're trying to get the gap so they can change your name and sex. The problem is also with the social, social security number. Most of the countries have them. 
in those numbers, there is two digits that divided gender. So that's also a problem. Maybe you can change your name in a neutral name, just not gender by their name, but your social number is revealing your sex. So that's a problem too. Hey, thank you. I think there's time for one more round of, of questions and then one more round of answers. So everybody who has a question should now raise his or her hand, okay? Um, because we only have 10 minutes left. Okay, that's one, two, three, four, and five. And then I will have to, that is, oh, and there's, I have missed someone over there? No. Okay, then these five people and then we have a round of answers and then I'm afraid we'll have to close. So, please. Maybe you can already line up at the microphone. <laughs> Hi, my name is Elliot. Um, I just want to say thank you guys for all for coming. I really um, appreciate today. Um, one thing when we were turning to our partner and um, talking about what was interesting was um, that um, I think uh, Witness and um, Agina and uh, sorry, I have to change your names and Jolene um, and others have spoken kind of about um, the work. Um, with trans communities and kind of criminalization and stuff based on actually evangelical churches and a lot of like Western colonial influences. And I think that's a really interesting point. And I would just like to hear people talk more about this. Um, also the point of having to use more Western terms to get funding and this kind of dynamic with keeping original um, cultural dynamics and stuff and the influence um, past and present of kind of Western colonialization. So Hi, my name is Lena. Um, I have a question to Naomi. Um, we've, we've heard that authorities do not recognize trans people or very poorly recognize them. Um, but I have a two-parter question. That is one, um, I hear that uh, trans people are quite visible in Southeast Asia and I would like to know how that translates first on the map, where are they very visible and where are they not so visible? And uh, secondly, how does that translate to recognition not by the authorities but by the general populace? Um, are trans people treated as human beings by the general populace? And if so, how? I have a question oh. to um, Witness Poison. Um, you described how, I think it was South Africa specifically, how legislation is basically directed at homosexuality and leaves out trans people. Um, you also described how you do outreach. I would be interested in hearing a bit more how you exactly do that outreach. What are the attitudes that you meet? What are you doing? And also how your relationship with LGB organizations is. I mean, do you find support there also with other social movements, maybe with human rights movements or, I mean, yeah, is there sort of cooperation or is it rather isolation or, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Moll. I've uh, just arrived in Berlin. I'm going to be spending a, a year here. Um, my, my question is actually quite similar to the first one. I was struck by the fact that most of the presenters today mentioned that the homophobic, transphobic laws are the result of uh, imperial rule, and particularly in British imperial rule. Um, and so I was, I was wondering whether this is used by activists, whether activists refer back to pre-colonial history and culture to argue that um, homophobia and transphobia is, is, is un-Indian, it's un-African, it's un-Tongan, uh, etc., Hello, my name is Jennifer. What I would like to know is which country can you recommend as a transgender people to go on holiday? Where is it safer to go? <laughs> oh, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, should we just should we just make a round of final answers? Um, in the Philippines, um, there are actually indigenous terms for sex and diverse 
sex and gender diverse people, and in many anthropological, sociological, and historical studies, um, you will find them. Um, there is a term called bakla and tomboy. Bakla is a, and tom, bakla and tomboy um, are gender terms that pertain to very effeminate men, bakla, and very masculine women, tomboy. Um, in, during the 60s, um, when America, the Americans brought um, psychiatry and psychology into the Philippines, um, and people were trying to make sense of sex and gender diversity locally, um, somehow there was a confusion as to the equivalence of these local terms that were gendered originally, um, and the making sense of sexuality in terms of um, terms that are being used in the West. And so now there is a conflation between sexual orientation and gender identity in such a way that the bakla is considered as an equivalent of the gay man. And the tomboy is the equivalent of the lesbian woman. And so this has um, invisibilized the trans experience for more than 50 years. Um, there is great debate in activist communities now as to what to do with, with these terms because um, they, um, they, 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 are, they live peacefully with Western terms like lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, but um, we are not sure how to, to, mo to mobilize these indigenous terms in terms of claiming rights. What are the rights of the bakla? What are the rights of, of the tomboy? But in terms of LGBT, the rights are very clear. Mm. So, within the trans community, feeling that the bakla and the tomboy do not capture who we are and our experience, we decided to coin, to coin our own term. So, to, um, we coined the term trans pinay, which is a combination of trans and Filipina. Pinay is short for Filipina, and a trans pinay is a transsexual woman of Filipino descent. A trans Pinoy is a transsexual man of Filipino descent. But of course, even among trans communities in my country, um, not, there is resistance. There is resistance to, to these terms. Uh, <clears throat> Western colonial, Western colonial. I just get tired of just thinking about them. Um, well, in my understanding, um, if the Western colonial didn't come to our countries, I think we will be very much in peace and we will be what we are today as a faculty, Vakasale Walewa or whatever terms that we were using in our own countries. We wouldn't be discriminated because our own ways, they all say that we're cannibals, that we were cannibals. Let me tell you, today is very much a cannibal world. Using our cultural terms, When it comes to transgenders, LGBT, we get confused. But in order for us to get money from the donors, we have to use those terms. MSM, LGBT, transgender, or whatever else comes after that. When we live in our own countries... Whether you're gay, transgender, transsexual, transvestite, or whatever you are, we live as one. In Tonga, we don't have any other word but ladies. When our lesbian friends and relatives come to our festival, we're all ladies. When we go to Fiji, it's the same thing. When we go to Samoa, it's, it's the same thing. We never use any other terms but our cultural terms. 
because we feel more comfortable when we use our own terms. The first time I ever knew about the word transgender is when we went to Sydney for the uh, gay games. In order for me to be passed to play in the netball game, I have to identify myself as a transgender. Well, (laughs) they required an ID that says female in order for me to play, to be able to play on the mixed team. In my passport, it says male, but I live as a female. I eat as a female. I sleep as a female. I dress as a female. What else do you want to know? (laughs) To me, that was so confusing. It's as confusing as coming into Frankfurt on the first day. And it's the same thing that happened to Naomi. I stood there. The guy at the immigration was so handsome. I was ready to flirt. I stood there, all dolled up. He looked at my passport, looked at me, looked at my passport, looked at me. I ended up saying, darling, if you're confused, I'm confused too. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, I would... I'd love to give a floor to the uh, second, uh, I mean, second phase panelist, but I can't tempt it for the last two questions like you, and you have mentioned that colonial issues. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, I think like, uh, yes, uh, while we are studying sociology, we are also uh, getting this kind of a question like this, that, oh, you guys are using, like, uh, those tricks uh, to uh, to actually, you know, b- defame us. Look at our country. We already changed our law. And then you poor, poor people and uncivilized people, you haven't changed yours. So that's your fault. I, I'd like to say three things. Number one, a, a one person ask a particular question as that uh, visibility is uh, a, a related question. I think in South Asia, Southeast Asia, in Asia, v- you can find trans people everywhere. Vis- I mean, coming out has never been an issue. We are we're already coming out in our family. So we are visible. We are, our identity is not recognized. We are not respected. So there's a two different things, visibility, recognition, and respect. So I think I'll just bring back this to we were always there in a society. Uh, perhaps uh, our record, and we were recognized uh, uh, pre-colonial, pre-colonial phase also. Hitler's running the troops in the Mughal period when British came to, uh, and, uh, and they are the most powerful in the Bahadur Shah Zafar's uh, time, I mean, when actually British came to uh, occupy Delhi. What I'd like to say that there may be disrespect, there, there may have uh, discrimination, but those are in a very Indian way. It was not putting them in a jail. It was not naming a community as a criminalized community. In 1860, British came, and with the Hijra become the criminalized cult in, in, as per our constitution. It, uh, it went, this law went in, in 1941. But still today, 2011, if any robbery happens, and if there is a territory of a Hijra group, police first come to that territory. Police come first knock to the Hijra house. So... It's just not, it's just not you bringing a law. You, you, you bringing a law, you bringing your own lens, your own culture, and we are suffering. I'm not blaming. You are, you are, you all are fellow activists. Let's stand up together and let's talk about, I mean, in my country, we say Srinanta Vishya Amrita Seputra. We all the God's child. I mean, not in a God, in a God way, like in any God. I'm talking about like we are, I mean, our souls are same. So let's talk about what, I mean, the, the way we, it's not about blaming anyone. 
and I fully respect you. I'm sure if, if I was part of any colonial, I mean, a, a country who colonized any other countries, um, I mean, I feel bad when, when I go to uh, East Africa and I see how Indian or people is actually treating um, uh, the citizen of uh, East Africa. And, and I feel re- equally bad. But it's just not blaming to it others but it's it's basically just to understand you're not bringing the law you're also bringing the culture you're also bringing your own lens you came back but we're still fighting within our own self whether we took our own indian lens or yours is better that's it Very, very short. Uh, I will just uh, point out that uh, maybe uh, I don't know which is the best country to go. I, I don't know. I know where not to go. For instance, in uh, in the Caribbean, I should not recommend you to go to Haiti, Jamaica, or Belize, because in these three countries uh, we have few problems because they are sodomy laws and they are actually apply even for for the the, the to fighting against HIV is very difficult because you cannot. Uh, uh, show yourself as uh, even as a gay man or or lesbian woman, n- much less uh, as a, a trans person. Um, but in Latin America, uh, there there are no uh, non-existent um, sodomy laws. And in this moment, the last one was repealed two years ago was in Nicaragua. Uh, but it doesn't mean that until very recently uh, we were put in jail because of the what so-called uh, dangerous dangerous zero city laws. There's laws that allow you to to put the, you in jail for up to two years just because you could be uh, a, a potential uh, person that was going to to commit a crime, and it was they, they were repealed just in in, in the early nineties, and since then uh, we were still detained. And so many times on the grounds of offending uh, public uh, public security or uh, or public mirrors, it's very very uh, uh, common, and it happens. It continues to happen, and well, that's why we, why we are here, and that's why what we're fighting for. Okay, I don't think I'm going to say something about the Western laws because I don't want us to to sound like we repeat ourselves here. Uh, because everything the other said is uh, what I'm going to say. And for, 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 especially for that question is yes, South African law is very Western because uh, although it co- comes out of apartheid, they only making few changes, but it's not South African, it's very Western. And then I will answer on the question of do we have a relationship with other LGBTI? Yes, very, very, very good relationships because the other LGBTI uh, uh, organizations, especially in South Africa, in Cape Town where I work, is they include trans people. But if you go into their office, you will see they they cater only for lesbian and gays, which is their right. But gender dynamics specific cater for trans people. But we also include our lesbian and gays in a way that we have support groups where we include them. We have our internet internet system where they can come into the office and go online. They can use our office uh, uh, phone. They can have coffee and whatever we have there, they can have there. And we also provide them taxi money if they don't. We also uh, help them if they have uh, 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 problems with the laws. If they don't have housing, if they have to to, to sleep on the streets. Yes, we also have them. We have a very good and strong relationship with SWEAT, which is our sex worker organization, where they specific, specific, where we do a, 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 a support group with transgender sex workers, because that is very, very common in South Africa. And we work all around, around Africa, where we have different, different organizations which cater for ELGB, but now thinking of including TI. And one of our 
own uh, a, a very, very, very strong uh, partner organization. It's an organization which caters only for intersex persons in South Africa. Thank you so much. Okay, and then before I close the evening, I would like to thank all the speakers on the panel again. I'd like to thank again Jana and Lisa from the Berl Foundation who made all of this here possible. I'd surely like to thank the people taking care of the technical equipment sitting over there, which has been fantastic. Thank you very much. And last but not least, thank the translators who have been doing a great job for the last three hours. And now it's a pleasure to close this evening and wish you all a very nice remaining night. Goodbye.